Welcome everybody to this sharky version of the chaotic year end event. I'm the Cora and I will be your announcement shark. It is my great pleasure to be able to announce the talk Post Quantum Cryptography Detours, Delays and Disasters by Tanya Lange and DJ Bernstein. Tanya Lange is a cryptographer and a number theorist. She specializes into post quantum cryptography that is replacing cryptography we use today with versions that are safe from attack from quantum computers. She's a professor at Eindhoven University of Technology, and she boasts a very impressive number of publications and lectures. She also was the coordinator of PQ Crypto, a pan-European consortium for the deployment of post-quantum crypto. DJB is a professor at University of Illinois of, in Chicago, and he's a professor at University of Bochum. He works on cryptography and he invented some of the ciphers used in open source cryptography, possibly some of the ciphers you're using right now to watch this talk. Together, they created an even more impressive set of projects ranging from simplifying the development of secure cryptography to building post-quantum secure primitives. Both of them are engaged as activists to fight for a more transparent cryptography standardization process. And now everybody, please put together your, your flippers to make a plitch plotch noise. Put your hands together for Tanya Lange and DJB. All right. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. Let's dive right into things. I'm going to start with HTTPS. So when you're going to an HTTPS website, a secure website, then you're using TLS, Transport Layer Security, to secure your communication. Now, TLS uses two kinds of cryptography for a few different reasons. First of all, it relies on public key cryptography. Now, that's doing two things for you. First of all, it's providing signatures, public key signatures. This makes sure that an attacker is not able to substitute the attacker's data for the server's data, pretend to be the server. And also, TLS is using public key encryption. For instance, NIST P256. RSA 4096 is a signature system. NIST P256 it can be used for encryption. And this is something which scrambles your data so that the attacker cannot understand it. Now, for performance reasons, the cryptographic picture is more complicated than just this public key cryptography. It also includes symmetric cryptography, sometimes called secret key cryptography. So this has, in when you put everything together into TLS, has three basic pieces. There's public key encryption. That's what Instead of scrambling your data so attackers can't understand it, public key encryption is just scrambling a key. It's sending a key securely, secretly from one end to the other. And then the signatures are used, public key signatures, to make sure that the attacker is not able to substitute a different key. And then that key is used to protect your data with symmetric cryptography. And then it's possible to have slides like this about every other protocol that you're using, like SSH, but OK, they all work pretty similarly to this. Now, I'm going to highlight two parts of this slide, the RSA 4096, typical signature system, and typical encryption system, NIST P256. Because these things are going to be broken by quantum computers. Without quantum computers, we don't know any threats against them. But once the attacker has a big quantum computer, which seems like it's going to happen, I mean, it's not a guarantee, maybe all the quantum computer efforts are going to fail for some reason, but it seems that quantum computing is more and more successful. And once the quantum computers are big enough, maybe 10 years from now, then attackers will be able to run an attack algorithm called Shor's algorithm, which will find your secret RSA key and your secret NIST P256 key. And this is something where the attackers can look back at the data they're recording now. It's not just a threat to future data. It's a threat to the confidentiality, the secrecy of your data today, because the attackers are already recording everything they can on the internet. And then when they have a big quantum computer, they will go back and retroactively decrypt everything because they can break RSA 4096 and NIST P256. In particular, the encryption is provided by NIST P256, and they can go back in time and break the encryption that you're using today. What do we do about this? Well, the Standard approach is what's called post-quantum cryptography. That's what you heard before was in our title. That's the replacement cryptography, which is designed assuming that the attacker has a big quantum computer. All right, so uh, the Herald had already nicely mentioned 
that uh, I was coordinator of a PK Crypto project, and that means I've been tingling the world around and already given talks about post-quantum cryptography. So here's a screenshot from a talk I gave, well, six and a half years ago, where I was highlighting, just like Dan was doing today, the importance of doing post-quantum cryptography. And I was highlighting that it's important to do recommendations to say what algorithms we should use in order to replace these RSA and uh, NISP-256 that you saw on the previous slides. And then I was also going into the question of, well, should we standardize now or standardize later? And there are arguments on both sides. And, well, standardizing now, six years ago, felt like there is still so much to do and we're going to have much better system if we wait a little bit longer. On the other hand, well, there is this concern about uh, lots of agencies and other dark forces collecting the data. And so that any day later that it gets rolled out would be a well, a loss of data, loss of security, and so it would be important to actually get things going. And so our solution back then, what I was advertising then in 2016, was in 2015, we had actually issued some recommendations saying, well, standardization takes a long time, we're not there yet, but if somebody wants to protect themselves, here's what we, and well, it's uh, quite a number of researchers who signed up this um, the statement as part of the Pico Crypto Project, what we recommend. And so our recommendations were what we call conservative in cryptography. So that doesn't mean politically conservative, it just means boring. It means that something has been around for a long time, lots of people have analyzed it, and we don't expect any changes there. On the symmetric key side, while well, Dan was already saying that those are basically unaffected by quantum computers. So if you're going for large enough sizes with 256-bit keys, then AS or SALSA20 or SHA-SHA20 are just fine. Also for authentication. So the part, once you have the key, is unaffected. And then for public key encryption and public key signatures, those were the ones where we have to replace the RSA4096 and the um, ECC and SP256. Those we have other replacements. And we gave here our high confidence one. So that's the McAleese system, which the name might appear again a bit later, and also uh, some hash based signatures um, and swings you're going to see later. And we also announced some under evaluations, which means, well, we're not quite comfortable if you use them now. But OK, in the future, those might be OK. And so for us, this was like, OK, we put a stake in the ground. We're saying these are safe. And so basically, well, People should do that, and everyone lives happy after, ever after and be done with the talk. Or did everybody live happily ever after? Let's take a look at what actually happened after this. So the setup of, well, here's some things to roll out. Actually, there was an experiment run by Google, which was saying in 2016, Google Chrome actually added a post-quantum option. Now, that doesn't mean that every web server was supporting it. It was just an experiment where Google also turned it on on some of their servers and said, OK, let's let's see how well this works. And they sounded really excited in the blog post announcing this, that they're going to be helping protect users against quantum computers. And let's see if this thing works. All right, the system they used is called New Hope. Now, they didn't just encrypt with New Hope. New Hope is a, a post-quantum encryption system. They also encrypted with pre-quantum encryption, elliptic curve cryptography, ECC. Like Tanya mentioned before, NISP-256 is an example of ECC. X25519 is another example of ECC. This is something you're using today to encrypt your data. And what Google did was encrypted with New Hope for hopefully post-quantum security and encrypted with X25519 like they're normally doing today. The point of this is that if something goes horribly wrong with New Hope, then we're still going to have pre-quantum security. So at least there won't be an immediate security problem. They're not making things worse. Uh, of course, if New Hope is broken, they're not making things better. But uh, the whole point was to try making things better and still guarantee that you're not making things worse by encrypting with both the pre-quantum and post-quantum stuff. And this is really important to have these backup plans because New Hope is a new crypto system. Well, it was in 2016. The main parts of the New Hope design were coming from 2010 and 2014 and 2015. And that's not a lot of time to review things. In cryptography, things can sometimes be around for years and then you find big security problems. So it's really important for these new crypto systems to give them time to mature. Another issue with new crypto systems is that, well, sometimes they're patented. Patents last for 20 years. And this happened for New Hope. A patent holder contacted Google and said, hey, I want some money for your New Hope experiment. 
Google never issued a public statement about this uh, patent threat, but for some reason in November 2016, they removed the New Hope option from Chrome and from their servers. Now, some more things happened in 2016. The US government has an agency, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which has a long history of cooperating with the US National Security Agency. And they said that one year later, the end of 2017, they would like cryptographers to submit proposals of post-quantum crypto systems, encryption systems and signature systems to be standardized eventually. And then one of the interesting things they said inside this uh, call for submissions is that you're not allowed to, to submit hybrids. So encrypting both with post-quantum systems and with ECC or signing with something that you're using now and whatever post-quantum proposal. They said the algorithms must not incorporate ECC or anything else that would be broken by quantum computers. From a software engineering perspective, it's good to have a, an ECC layer separately from everything else and say, whatever you do post-quantum will combine with X25519, for example. But they weren't saying you, you must combine everything with ECC, uh, say with X25519 as a separate layer. They were just saying, do not submit anything combined with ECC. Now, by setting up this competition for post-quantum crypto, NIST was telling industry, please wait, please don't deploy post-quantum crypto. And, and this was, there's sort of a carrot and a stick. I mean, the, the stick here is patents where um, it, Google had just gotten in trouble for, for deploying something and oops, there's a patent on it. What else is patented? Well, and NIST said, we are going to have a process leading to cryptographic standards that can be freely implemented. So no patents stopping you from implementing things. And they also said, we're going to select something that's strong. They said the security provided by a cryptographic scheme is the most important factor in the evaluation. So, okay, industry looking at this says, yeah, okay, let's, let's wait for, for NIST. And also other standardization organizations said, let's wait. So IETF has a research organization, IRTF, setting internet standards. And well, the, the crypto group inside IRTF said, well, for, for a few things that are sitting around that we're looking at already, we'll, we'll standardize those, some hash-based systems. But for everything else, we're going to wait for NIST. And ISO, the International Standards Organization, they also said, we're going to wait for NIST. And not absolutely every organization said this. For example, the Chinese government said, we're going to run our own competition. but well, who cares? All right, so back to the NIST competition. So here is the whole big flood of submissions. So end of 2017, there were 69 submissions from 260 cryptographers. Not gonna read out all these names, but this was quite a load for the crypt analysts. So this was something where, hey, look, we had some fun early 2017. Those who have seen us on stage um, around then in 2018, we've been given talks about all the fun we had in breaking those, but it was quite a load. Well, let's see what NIST was doing in the competition. So 2019, so two years, well, year and a bit later, they were narrowing down the field to 26 candidates. And then in 2020, in July, they were also narrowing it down even further out of these 26. They were taking only 15 candidates. Well, the purpose for that is to focus the attention on something, so that makes sense. And then, of course, I mean, they're prioritizing the strongest candidates, except for when there's an application that really, really needs something more efficient. Actually, no, that's not what they did at all. If you read the report and you look at which candidates they selected, whenever they had a choice between speed and security, I mean, they threw away things which were definitely broken and they threw away things that were clearly so inefficient, nobody could possibly use them. But taking, for example, Sphinx, that was Tanya mentioned before, very conservative. Everybody agrees this is the safest signature system that's there. And well, NIST did not say, of course, use Sphinx, the, the current version, Sphinx Plus, with all sorts of choices. Uh, they didn't say use Sphinx Plus. They said, well, we're going to wait on standardizing Sphinx Plus unless so many things are broken that, well, we feel like we have to use Sphinx Plus. And, well, okay, so then uh, in uh, July this year, they said, all right, we are selecting uh, four standards. Um, one of those was Sphinx Plus, along with four more candidates to continue studying. And well, that might tell you, hey, uh, okay, maybe their confidence was shaken. So what happened there? All right, so seeing the 2069 uh, submissions again, fast forwarding by five and a half years, the picture looks quite different. 
Okay, so here's a color coding. The blue ones are the ones that are still in the NIST competition. So those are the four to be standardized systems and four, round four candidates. Um, gray ones didn't make it and means that they haven't been broken, but that might just be, well, they were deselected so early that nobody was interested in breaking them anymore. Uh, the brown color stands for less security than claimed. Red, really broken. Red with an underline means <clears throat> really, really, I mean, like, I mean it broken, like attack scripts. So first of all, what you can see from a, from a glimpse at this, there's a lot of broken schemes. There's also some interesting purple fairly far on the right bottom. And if you remember from watercolors, purple is the mix of red and blue. So Psyche was selected in July and broken in July after analysis of something like five years um, with an attack which is running now in seconds. So Psyche is kind of the poster child of something really going wrong, but there were lots of things that we could say, yeah, they shook the confidence a little bit which, well, then made NIST at least select swings. They didn't cause them to select all other conservative choices. Some of those are still on the back burner. But um, just to see, this is not a mature field. Now, what was happening for deployment in the meantime? Remember, there, there's two pieces from Tanya's slides from 2016. She was saying, well, you want to roll something out now to protect people because we have a security problem now. Attackers are recording things now, and we have to try to protect that. And we have to do that faster than the standardization process, which Google was starting in 2016, but they got scared because of, well, the, the patent problem. Um, well, okay, by 2019, Industry and various open source projects were starting to look at this and say, you know, actually, maybe it's uh, time to get back to rolling things out. I mean, something went wrong in 2016, but uh, okay, at this point, NIST has collected statements from all the submitters in this competition saying which submissions are patented. And so, okay, that gives us a lot of information from, from 260 cryptographers saying what they have patents on. And also, it's becoming more and more obvious in 2019 that big quantum computers are coming. So examples of what happened in 2019, OpenSSH version 8, copying TinySSH, said, we're going to add a uh, hybrid elliptic curve cryptography plus streamline and true prime. So this is one of the uh, post-quantum encryption proposals. Not something used by default, but if you put a line into your server configuration and a line in the client configuration, then it's using post-quantum crypto. And well, if the entrue part of that gets broken, then at least there's still ECC. July 2019, Google and Cloudflare ran a big experiment with post-quantum crypto with two parts of that experiment. One option in the experiment, some users were encrypting with another version of Entru, Entru HRSS, plus ECC, of course, always use hybrids. Uh, and then the second option was encrypting with Psyche, plus, plus ECC. Yeah, Tanya says, oops. And this is an example of how important it is to make sure you're combining everything with ECC, elliptic curve crypto, so that you do not lose security compared to today, where we're all using elliptic curve crypto. Try experimenting with the post-quantum system plus ECC, so that the worst case is that you, you are doing nothing, but I mean, hopefully something's getting better. The, the psych users at least had the ECC security. The entry users, as far as we know, they're, they're okay. Also in 2019, in October, Google claimed quantum supremacy, meaning that they had a quantum computer doing something faster than any regular supercomputer could do it. It's not a useful computation, and it's still going to be years before we have useful computations running on quantum computers faster than regular computers. But it's still, I mean, the name quantum supremacy is really misleading, but it, it, it is an interesting step forward in quantum computing. And I, I guess the name also attracted attention to this as something that people have to worry about for the future. Now, in 2021 and 2022, OpenSSH and also IPsec software and OpenBSD and internal communication in, in Google, all of these suddenly upgraded to actually, well, OpenSSH version 9.0 is providing a version of Entru plus ECC by default. So if you have OpenSSH 9 installed on your server and whichever server you're connecting to and your client, then um, it's just automatically trying this, this post-quantum option. 
And actually, open SSH back to version 8.5 supports exactly the same thing. You, in that case, you have to turn on uh, a configuration line um, for the client and the server to use it. But uh, open SSH 9, it's just being done by default. And same for, for Google. They are now, as of November, so last month, they are encrypting their internal communication with uh, the other entry variant I mentioned, entry HRSS, and elliptic curve crypto, so that uh, hopefully the entry holds up and then that's secure against future quantum computers. And this is also nicely in line with, well, what the standardization body is saying. So as Dan said before, um, standardization bodies are not yet standardizing the crypto system themselves, but they're encouraging people to look into things and, well, get used to it. For instance, the uh, US American NC, so that's the banking standard NCX9, they say that, well, yes, they will eventually get to post quantum standards. So they're expecting a simultaneous use of both classical cryptography which we call pre-quantum cryptography and post-quantum crypto for both security and acceptance. So they're also they're thinking, well, look, the one thing is uh, standardized and audited and the other part is this slightly still new, uncomfortable, but okay, we need it for long-term security as well. And they might even require this hybrid combination for long-term. Now, from the US to the French, so ANSI to ANSI, so that's the French uh, standardization or the well, security office. They're also saying, well, definitely don't use uh, post-quantum crypto alone because it's super important. Post-quantum crypto is kind of immature. However, the immaturity should not serve as an argument for postponing the first deployments. So NC is, or NC is, is really encouraging people to um, start using hybrids, using some well, well-established pre-quantum cryptography together with some post-quantum cryptography. All right, great. So everything's moving forward along the lines that were in Tanya's slides from 2016, that there's, I mean, standardization is is slowly moving. But in the meantime, we're rolling out, trying to roll out post-quantum crypto along with ECC in case something goes wrong. And then, well, uh, trying to get users protected as quickly as possible. Now, what did the U.S. government say about this? Well, it turns out, starting in 2021, the U.S. government made very clear that it wants you now, you, you might be thinking they want you to protect yourself against quantum computers. But no, no, no. They want you to not protect yourself against quantum computers. For example, here's a quote from the chief of the computer security division in NIST's Information Technology Laboratory, which is the, the head of the division running this post-quantum competition. In July 2021, shortly after, well, various OpenBSD projects and OpenSSH started uh, rolling things out, he said, do not let people start to buy and implement non-standard post-quantum cryptography. And then another example, NSA, that works closely with NIST, said, do not implement or use non-standard post-quantum cryptography. And just in case people didn't get the message, the Department of Homeland Security do you think maybe these agencies talk to each other? Uh, Department of Homeland Security said, do not use post-quantum cryptographic industry products until standardization, implementation, and testing of replacement products with approved algorithms are completed by NIST. All right, so that's already kind of um, unhappy news. Uh, the other part that's really weird about this is it, what they're saying is if you're deploying post-quantum cryptography, that you should not use hybrids. And you might think, like, did I maybe misunderstand a not for a yes or something? So here was an NSA guy at a conference, and while well, this slide was snapped by Marco Sarin, but I was in that talk, and I can confirm, he was really pointing out that, no, you shall not do crypt, um, hybrids. He was also echoing the message of, yeah, yeah, don't mark with crypto, so don't use anything right now. But also, they do not expect to approve post-quantum algorithms with any kind of just-to-be-safe combined with an older algorithm guidance. And afterwards, they also posted more guidance saying that, no, it will be a one-to-one -one replacement. Rip out ECC and RSA, plug in post-quantum crypto. And their argument for it is basically, well, there might be bugs in your elliptic curve software, so turn off elliptic curve cryptography. Not a good idea. Um, unless, of course, you're the attacker, then it's a great idea. Now, you might be thinking, okay, okay, of course we're going to use um, hybrids, even if NSA is trying to encourage people not to. Everybody else wants to use hybrids. And and for this thing saying don't uh, don't use something non-standard, well, it, it, that delay is is done now. I mean, that's what NIST said in July, right? They they said we're standardizing Kyber. 
and that means deploy Kyber. Um, well, no, actually, they're not saying that. So let's look at the details. Uh, first of all, remember there was this patent problem for, for Google with New Hope. Um, well, uh, the son of New Hope is called Kyber. Kyber is, is sort of, uh, apparently they were confusing uh, Star Trek and Star Wars, so internally they were rumored to have Kyber named um, New Hope the Next Generation, and then they um, uh, managed to get a better name for it later. So anyway, Kyber is, is a lot like New Hope, but it's, it's got patent problems. And this is the only encryption system. NIST selected Sphinx Plus and selected two other signature possibilities and selected one encryption system, Kyber. So that's the only way to protect your data with what NIST says it's, it's selected as standards for post-quantum crypto. And Kyber, like New Hope, is in the middle of, well, seven different patent families that we know about. doesn't mean they all apply. It's pretty complicated to figure out. If you're looking at a patent, you have to understand how patent law works and analyze what the patent means in terms of all the prior art and the extensions that patent law applies. And well, okay, it's, it's complicated. The one easy way to get out of patents is to buy them and give them away for free. And so NIST in July said, we negotiated with several third parties to enter into various agreements to overcome potential adoption challenges posed by third party patents. Okay, great, party, um, can use Kyber. Except, well, companies look at this and say, um, can you please show us the agreements so we can see what exactly you signed? For example, Scott Fleurer from Cisco said, Cisco cannot use Kyber until we get the text of the licenses. Okay, so then, well, yeah, it turned out, uh, if you look more closely, NIST actually admitted that they had not signed anything in July, but they said they would. And in November, they finally said, Yes, we have signed two license agreements, and here's some excerpts from the text of the licenses. Great, party, we can use Kyber. But if you look at the text, the licenses are for a standard prescribed by NIST. Any modification, anything different from what NIST standardizes for Kyber, you are not allowed to use under these licenses. You must use exactly what they have standardized. And now you, you might be thinking, well, okay, they... they selected Kyber. They standardized it in July. But no, they didn't. What they said in July is we are planning to standardize Kyber, which is not the same as saying we have standardized Kyber. They are aiming to complete their initial Kyber standard by around 2024. And even worse, we don't actually know what Kyber version 2024 is going to be because they're still proposing changes to it. So to summarize, in 2024, if that's when they issue the standard, then the license will let you use whatever Kyber is standardized at that point. And maybe in 2023, they'll settle down, they will stabilize um, Kyber. And maybe the other five patent families that we know about do not apply to Kyber. Uh, there are cases where people have walked through a minefield and not gotten blown up. All right, that brings us to the end of our talk. I think we explained uh, enough about the delays and detours. Now, what do we mean by disasters? Of course, I mean, something getting broken that uh, was already deployed in a Google and Cloudflare experiment is, is, is a disaster, but it was a backup plan because they were using hybrids, so that was kind of okay. What we really think is a disaster is that we're here in 2022 and we still do not have post-con cryptography on your mobile phones, on your laptops. It's still not widely deployed. We're happy to point to examples where it's getting used, but it's not widely deployed. Your data is still pre-quantum encrypted and therefore, well, ultimately decryptable with a quantum computer. And that's a real disaster. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Nor the technology I use in the background are using post-quantum cryptography, which is sad. I think my SSH connection does at least, so I guess it's something. Always we we can always count on OpenBSD. Um Absolutely. So I let's check if there are some questions. So one question would be as a developer, developing some software, not necessarily cryptographic. Should I ensure the crypto is I use is post quantum secure in a hybrid way right now? Well, you have a, a slide exactly on this. Come on, show the slide. 
Well, I mean, we, we did foresee some questions about like, well, this was kind of depressing. What can we do now? And so we have a slide prepared of a little bit more optimistic. What can you do now? And of course, yes, our suggestion is to deploy hybrids. Um, I'm feeling like this, this flashback to 2016 where I was going like, hey, you can do something now. Here are our suggestions. These we feel really, really comfortable about. And here I'm still standing 2022, December, saying, yeah, MacLeese is actually a very conservative system and we don't have this patent trouble that uh, Kyber is going through. And you can do something. Um, so to explain a little bit what hybrid means is it means to combine a, a pre-quant with a post-quant system. And so in, in encryption, you want them to jointly generate a key. And in public key signatures, of course, you have to ensure that both signatures individually are valid in order for the, the hybrid signature to be valid. You want to say something about the choice? Um, oh, uh, just, I mean, there are various uh, libraries out there that you can take a look at, which will give you an idea of some of the uh, different systems that you can try deploying. When you look at the libraries, the, the software quality is not as bad as it was a few years ago for post-quantum software. Um, there's, there's some people who are putting a lot of work into improving the software quality. There's still a lot of risks there, but um, it, it, um, I, I think, I mean, compared to the risk of doing nothing and guaranteeing that data is going to be exposed to future attackers with quantum computers that are recording the data right now, um, you definitely want to try things out. So, for example, one of the libraries that has a few different systems implemented is called Open Quantum Safe, OQS. Um, there's various other libraries specific to uh, particular crypto systems. So most system designers have some sort of software. But uh, again, you have to worry about how good the, the software quality is. Um, there's a, a new library coming out, um, LibJade, which has a, a lot of verification of the, the software. Um, so I would say very high quality, but unfortunately, the only post-quantum um, encryption system that it provides at the moment is Kyber, which, well, I mean, planning ahead for 2024, that becomes usable. But right now, um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, so if you want something which is that kind of speed, um, then, well, if you look at what OpenSSH is doing, or what Google is doing with different versions of Entru, then the, the software there has been at least somewhat battle tested. So you can try try doing that. But always make sure you're doing hybrids with, with ECC, um, just in case something goes horribly wrong with the, the post-quantum part. Isn't it kind of hard to develop my own combiner, though? So because I still need to have a correct way of combining the two schemes, the pre-quantum one and the post-quantum one. It, you do, yes. And, and it is definitely possible. So even something as simple as saying, like sign with one system, sign with the other system, check both signatures. We have seen software getting that wrong. So it's it's definitely important to to go through that very, very carefully. For for encryption, um, you, you typically you have ECC is exchanging a key and then your post quantum system is exchanging a key and you hash both of those keys together with whatever your favorite hash function is, standard hash function, that'll be fine. Um, but again, that's something that, yes, you're saying combiners, there's various study of standard means how people get this hash wrong. Function. Sorry, not say that it again? Anybody gets the standard means cryptographic hash function, not use something like X hash, use something that's cryptographic. Yeah, so, so take, for example, take SHA-512. And um, I mean, that's that's a, it's an NSA design, actually, but people have been bashing on it for a long time and have not broken it. Um, for something which has gone through more public review, there's the SHA-3 systems, and that's something which it's usually not a performance problem to be hashing like two 32-byte strings together. I mean, concatenate them and then hash, and you'll get another uh, string coming out of that, and then that's your, your key for your symmetric cryptography. Now, there are some proposals of how to do this. So there's an RFC, so from the um, IRTF, so CFRG, and there's also something in the NIST standards of how you can do hybrids uh, to put a little bit of, of self-advertisement. We have a last slide of the, the slide deck that will be uploaded. And for instance, there are some ENISA studies um, that we co-authored. And so in those, we're also going through details of how you can combine hybrids. So how you can safely do this. And of course, there's still the choice. Um, so you would be selecting your own system. And well, as you can see, there's some concerns with the patent situation. I should also say for research, for experiments, you can use Skype. It's just a problem if you want to deploy it. 
So, I mean, like there's a warning in general, but if you're just a hobbyist or tinkering with it, want to write a research paper, it's not a problem. But in general, you have a choice between using the most efficient systems, which is basically what Google has been doing, saying, well, let's try something new and shiny and see whether it blows up our computers. And luckily, it didn't blow up the computers. So Google could continue operating with with a combination of New Hope or later on Entru and ECC. Um, or you could say, well, the most important part is that systems remain secure. We're willing to do a little hit and speed or bandwidth and so on. And so we're taking the most conservative post one systems and combine them with elliptic curves and RSA. So that's also a choice that you would need to do if you, well, want to roll it out. So would it be okay to deploy um, uh, one of one of the uh, ciphers that are still left in the competition that is not yet or will not be standardized by NIST, even though there's no known attack? So in general, I guess Tanya's going to fire up the uh, colorful picture here. Um, when you look at a picture like this with so much red on there, then it, you have to feel like, as cryptographers, we don't know what we're doing. I mean, how could we have so many things being broken? It's it's really, really risky. And um, I, I would say that whether something has been picked by NIST or not is not actually adding that much information here. Um, okay, you, you want to comment on this? Well, I have to say that things that are deselected in the first round really didn't get much attention. I, would, I mean, people did lose interest. Things that are survived into the third round and then did, just didn't get selected in the fourth round, for instance, like the two entro variants, so entro prime and entro HRSS chem that I mentioned here, um, those got into the third round, survived till the end of the third round, and then just didn't win the beauty competition that NIST was running. And so I think those are just as fine as the ones which are in blue. But in general, all these things are scary. There's very few, yeah, so, so, um, Andrew and Andrew HRSS, those are the ones that are rolled out in, by Google and, and OpenSSH. But, but very few of these things, uh, very few of the 69 submissions have the same security level now against known attacks as they had five years ago when they were submitted. Um, so, it, I mean, there's, there's always been some loss of security because attacks are getting better. Um, it's just that, well, some had enough of a security margin to survive that. But it, it, to, to make a safe decision, it's unfortunately, um, it's necessary to look at the history of these things and say, all right, how well have they held up? How much have the, they been studied? Exactly what Tanya was emphasizing. But, I mean, there's some of these things that have been studied very little. Some have been studied more. And um, it's, it's how well the systems have held up through that study that really dictates how risky they are in the end. I mean, for instance, Three Bears is a beautiful system, but it was deselected after round two. And so I guess it just stopped people from looking and it didn't get much analysis before. So it feels like it should be fine, but it's also severely under-researched. But if you're looking at the uh, round three selection of those which are still black or dark gray here, I would say those are mostly fine. And of course, the blue ones as well. Okay, choose one that is blue or black on this slide. I think that is some pretty specific guidance. Um, very, very quick last questions. If I'm a if I'm a tinfoil hat, can I do anything to protect my communication? Well, uh, tunnel things through OpenSSH. That's a good start. Um, I mean, the situation right now, most communication, of course, you need the client and the server to be supporting things. And well, there, there's various experiments and a little bit of real deployment um, where, I mean... There's some, VPN, there's some VPN deployment, for instance. Yeah, so right, there's some, some post-quantum VPN. So um, Mulvad has um, a, a post-quantum option. So they're using McLeese and you can... Um, so they're, they're using WireGuard for the VPN. And then um, WireGuard has an option for feeding in an, an extra key, a pre-shared key, which Mulvad is doing with McLeese. So you sort of upload through McLeese for post-quantum security to Mulvad. Now, of course, that, that's a VPN where you're not going end-to-end -to, -end to, you know, you want to, to go all the way to whichever site you're communicating with. And getting end-to-end -end security rolled out means that the client and the ultimate server need to support post-quantum crypto. And, well, with lots of delays of that happening, it's, it's unfortunately much less in place than um, could have imagined years ago when, when it seemed like there was a lot of enthusiasm for that. Who worked on something? 
Oh, well, okay. Tanya would like me to uh, put in a plug for PQ Connect coming soon, which is uh, hopefully going to make it a lot easier to deploy some post-quantum crypto for securing your connections end-to-end. But uh, that's still not released yet, so um, can't say too much about it. Look for PQ Connect. I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for being here and sharing your information, sharing this update about post-quantum cryptography. Um, Thank you so much, Tanya Lange and DJB. Thank you.